As they are coming, I see some coming down. I'm going to go ahead. I want to tell you a story that comes from about 1870. Now, 1870, to give you a little historical context, that was about five years after the American Civil War. And in 1870, on July the 23rd, not in the United States, but over in China, there was a missionary, a British missionary, and his wife, she was lying in bed, he was sitting there beside the bed, and they were carrying on what would be one of their last conversations. This British missionary, whose name is Hudson Taylor, was speaking to his 33-year-old wife, Maria. And we have recorded today their, some of their very last words because he wrote them down for posterity's sake. And this is from a book that he had written. It's, he said, My darling, are you conscious that you are dying? And Maria said, Dying? Do you think so? And he replied, Yes, you are going home. You will soon be with Jesus. And Maria said to Hudson, said, I am so sorry. And he asked, you're not sorry to go be with Jesus? And she explained, oh no, it's not that. You know, darling, that for the ten years past, there has not been a cloud between me and my Savior. Now you remember that. She says, for the past ten years, there has not been a cloud between me and my Savior. I cannot be sorry to go to Him. But it does grieve me to leave you alone at such a time. Yet, He will be with you and meet all of your needs. Now these are the words of Hudson and Maria Taylor in 1870. Hudson Taylor is a very famous missionary in those early days of modern missions. And when he spoke these words to his dying wife, he was speaking to a woman who was not unfamiliar with grief. Her parents had moved to China and had become missionaries in China themselves. And when she was six years old, her daddy died there in China. Her mom decided to stay and to continue the work. And when Maria was ten years old, her mother died. And she and her sister became orphans at a girls, all-girls school that another British missionary lady was running. And, and she grew up from 10 to getting in her later teens. When she met in those later teens a young British missionary man who came to China, who had adopted some very unusual missionary practices for that day because he enculturated himself in the Chinese culture. He began to wear the same clothes that the Chinese men would wear. He grew out his hair in that braided ponytail that we often see from 150 years ago. He was enculturating himself, becoming like a Chinese man in order to win Chinese to Christ. And the other British missionaries did not like it at the time. And when Maria expressed to her family back in England, that she wanted to marry this young man. The family resisted, and especially the woman who was her caretaker there at that all-girls school. They resisted for a time, but finally gave in. And in 1858, young Maria married young Hudson Taylor. And over the next decade or so, they had nine children. Three of those children died in childbirth. Two of those children died from disease and deprivation of the culture. And now, Hudson is sitting beside his wife who is about to die as well. Maria knew grief. And yet, listen, she said, not a day has gone by with a cloud between me and my Savior. Not a cloud. How could Maria maintain such an attitude when she had seen so many things that grieved her heart? Her parents dying when she was young. Three children dying in infancy. Two dying later before the age of ten. How could she maintain this? How could Hudson Taylor, for decades after his wife died, having all these children die, having his very wife die, how could he maintain faithfulness in experiencing all of this grief. And I would contend the way he did it was he didn't focus on the here and the now. He focused on the one day in the future. And as Christians, we look back 
to see Jesus Christ. We look back to see the history of our salvation developing. But as Christians, we also look to the future for what our hope is in Christ in the future in order to get us through the difficult times in the present, just like Hudson and Maria Taylor did 150 years ago. And that's exactly what we're going to see today, how the Apostle Paul was trying to encourage the Thessalonian Christians who were experiencing something they had not anticipated. They were experiencing the death of their loved ones who had put their faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul was supernaturally inspired by the Holy Spirit to give them a word about life and death and life thereafter in order to comfort and encourage them as they were processing through the grief of separation. And that's what I want to share with you today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. The first thing that we see Paul talking about is the fact that separation saddens. Separation saddens. Always has, always will until the Lord returns. Verses 13 and 14, Paul writes, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, these are the words that Paul was inspired to share with the Thessalonians. Why? It's because the Thessalonians, like all of those early Christians, the apostles, Paul, and others, they knew the fact that Jesus had died, that He had been buried, that He raised. They knew the fact that 40 days later He ascended back into heaven with the promise that He would one day return. Now, the early Christians believed that that return was going to happen very quickly. They believed that Jesus would come back during their lifetime. So when Christians like the Thessalonians began to see their loved ones die before Jesus' return, they died faith in Christ. They were confused. I thought Jesus was going to come back because they believed that they would not experience death before His return. Now, we know in hindsight every one of them did. But they didn't know it, and when people they cared about died, they were confused. And folks, the world has always been confused concerning this subject of death. From the moment it entered into the world with Adam and Eve's first sin until all the way to our day, the world has always been confused about death. The world has been trying to figure out this thing called death. And the world, I believe, has been demonically influenced in such ways that it has created all kinds of false understandings about life and death and life thereafter. For instance, in the ancient world, we see that in certain parts of the world, this whole concept of reincarnation developed. The idea that I will live my life for these short, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, and then when I die, somehow supernaturally I'm going to be recreated, reincarnated into some other kind of flesh, like a cow or a pig, a rabbit. And they, in this reincarnated state, understood that the relationships I had when I was a human will not be the kind of relationships I will have when I am reincarnated. Now, this is something that has ancient origins, and I think demonically. Uh, created in people's minds. But there's also other kinds of wrong views about death. There are people who believe that when a person dies that their spirit, and they see the spirit as sort of impersonal, doesn't have personality, doesn't have uh, consciousness. They just believe that their spirit sort of float off into the Netherlands. The Romans had this kind of concept of the Elysian fields, where when one died and if one had been uh, enculturated in the mystery religions, then their spirits would just sort of float out there into nothingness and exist in this spiritual, impersonal condition. But then there were also people in the ancient world that believed that when a person died, game done. That when they die, there was nothing else that their whole being was annihilated and done. So there were a lot of wrong thoughts about death that I believe that the the demons and Satan himself influenced people to develop through the centuries. And folks, all of these same wrong thinking about death still persists today. In India, the majority religion believes still in reincarnation. In Japan, you've got religions like Shintoism that believes that the ancestors, their spirits go off into that netherland and there isn't any 
chance in the future to have the same kind of relationship they had now. And in America and Europe, it's secular atheism. It's the belief that when a person dies that they are dead and there is no longer consciousness that that person will ever feel. Now this one, this secular atheistic view of life after death, that there is no life, that's the one we're facing mostly when we are engaging people. Uh, for instance, probably one of the guys of the 20th century and beginning of 21st century who is reputed to be one of the smartest men in history, his name was Stephen Hawking. He was a British cosmologist. He believed that he could figure out with his own brain power the origins of all things that exist. He contemplated where all things were going to the point where they may no longer exist. And we know he contemplated the issues of life and death. In fact, he contemplated it so much, it's probably because death was an ever-present reality that he anticipated. You see, Stephen Hawking for almost 50 years suffered with ALS. You know, no ALS, right? Lou Gehrig's disease. And for almost 50 years, his body just continued to just shrivel up. So he knew he could die at any time. And he spoke about life and death. For instance, in one article I read this week, it's, he said, I have lived with the prospect of an early death for the last 49 years. I'm not afraid of death, but I'm in no hurry to die. I have so much I want to do first. So we know he thought about death, but what did he think about death? In another article I read, this is what he said. He said, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. So we see what the reputed smartest of smart man in the 20th century and, and one of the smartest in all of human history you see how he bought into the wrong view of death that the world has been promulgating for centuries. But see, we see this over and over in our culture in America. I was reading other articles this week, and one article I read, uh, an atheist said, I have always felt that when I die, I am dead and gone. My conscious life will end. My interaction with others will end, and I will be simply gone. Another atheist sadly writes, I think that when I die, I'll cease to exist. I'll probably be sad to die, yeah. And I'd hate to think that I was about to die anytime soon. I'm still glad, in principle, that someday life will cease. And one other atheist I came across said, what we think happens when we die is that when we die, only our contributions to the world we are departing will live on. And that's all there is to it. We're not going to be around to experience it afterwards. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read these atheists' view of death and the finality, and that's it, that just breaks my heart. If that was true, there would be no hope in this life. I mean, we would all, like Stephen Hawking, we would all be just anxiously awaiting death, unable to enjoy the present, as so many people in the world do today. And yet, Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write comforting words to the Thessalonian Christians to say, no, these worldviews are wrong. You need to understand. Yes, death saddens, but we have hope in Christ. And that's the two things I want you to know. On your handout you have this morning, the first thing is that the world sorrows with no hope, just like Stephen Hawkins. He had no hope once death crept in. But folks, as the church, we know that we, yes, we sorrow, but we sorrow with hope. And our hope is found only in Jesus Christ. Now, the whole Bible speaks to this idea that there's something else after death. In fact, we can go all the way into the Old Testament and see hints of this, even though it's not explained in great detail. For instance, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we read how King David... You remember King David and Bathsheba? They had an affair. And after the affair, King David manipulated circumstances so that Bathsheba's husband would be killed in military conquest, and, and he was... And then we know King David married Bathsheba because Bathsheba had gotten pregnant during their affair. 
Well, Bathsheba had that baby, and apparently that baby was sick. He was a little baby boy. So we read in 2 Samuel chapter 12 how King David was praying before the Lord. He was begging. He was pleading. He was crying out to God, God, please save my baby boy. And he would not be consoled, we are told. King David didn't eat. He didn't drink. He didn't bathe. All he was doing was begging for the life of his baby boy. And you know what happened? God let that baby die. His permissive will allowed the baby to die that David so greatly begged for his life. How did David respond to that? In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verses 22 through 23, it says, David said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now... He, the child, is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Listen to what David said last. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. See, we're already catching a glimpse in the Bible all the way back to King David's an understanding that when a person dies, that person crosses over into what we call the afterlife. And, and when a baby dies, I believe with all my heart that that baby is covered by the blood of Christ. I believe that King David's baby was covered by the blood of Christ, looking forward to Christ's sacrifice. Babies today who die are covered by the blood of Christ, looking back to Christ and His sacrifice. So I believe that baby went to be in the presence of the Lord, and David did as well. Because David said, my son will not come back to me in this life. You don't come back. But he said, I will go to him. He understood there's life after death. And all will cross over. And those who cross under the grace of God, they will be reunited with others who cross over with the grace of God. And that is what David reveals to us here. That's what Paul is revealing to the Thessalonians. He's saying, look, church, I know you've got loved ones. You didn't think we were going to die before Christ returns, but they have. I know it's breaking your heart because separation, physical separation, always saddens our heart. But you need to look to the promise of Christ's return because it is in the promise of the future that we can deal with the sadness of the present. And that is a principle that is undeniable in Scripture and a principle that, by which we all ought to be living. Yes, separation saddens, but when it comes to Christians and their faith in Christ, we need to understand reunion revives. Understanding about the reunion of God and His saints revive our souls in the middle of our sadness. And that's what Paul was trying to do in verses 15 through 18. He writes, he says, For this we say to you, Thessalonians, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And what we see is Paul is telling the Thessalonians, I know you're sad because your loved ones, you've been separated from them with death. But know this, if they are in Christ, there is a great reunion day coming in the future, and that thought of the future should help you work through the emotions of the present. Now there's four truths that Paul shares with the Thessalonians about life, death, and life thereafter. And these same four truths we need to understand even today. First of all, I want you to see that reunion requires a rift. A rift, a, a ripping apart, a separating. And notice in verse 15, Paul writes, he says, We who are alive and remain. 
Now the we here he's talking about is he and the Thessalonians. They are still alive, but there are some who have died and gone on. He's saying we are alive and we remain here on this side of eternity, but I recognize you've got loved ones who have gone on to the other side of eternity. We have been ripped apart from our loved ones who have died in Christ. And Paul's acknowledging that. And folks, today we still experience relational rifts because we live in a sin-fallen world. Now, the ultimate rift, I would contend, is death. And that's what Paul was literally dealing with with the Thessalonians. But there are a lot of lesser rifts that we deal with that really prepare our heart that there's a really big one coming in the future, which is death. Now, some of these smaller, lesser rifts, sometimes it may be people moving away to another part of the country or another part of the world, and the physical separation between you and those people you love, it is a separation that saddens your heart even though it's not the rifting apart of death. You know, there are parents, you all who are parents who have children who have grown up, they have left your home and maybe just gone down the street to get married or move out and start a career. Well, that leaving of your home, of your grown children, that creates a rift. Your relationship changes, and they don't even have to be far from you. It's not a bad rift, but it's a rift because there's distance. You know, there's other people who experience rifts when they get into an argument with a longtime friend or family member, and the argument is so severe that you are never able to talk to that person again the same way you did before that argument. That is a rift that saddens your heart to the day you go and be with the Lord. Think about Paul and Barnabas. They were rifted apart that way. Or there are people, and this one is sad to watch, there are family members who look at their aging parents or grandparents who are starting to slide into dementia or other mental diseases, and they have to watch their loved one forget their name. Forget all of the experiences that they once had with them. Now, they're not physically separated from them like the others, but they are mentally separated, and that rift saddens. Now, every one of us in life, I look at the young people, you may be thinking, I don't know what he's talking about. You will if you live long enough. Most of you that I'm looking at who are a little bit older, you've already experienced a lot of these. Why? Because in a sin-fallen world, we are rifted away from people we love in a variety of ways. And that points to that ultimate ripping apart of our relationship through death because of our sin. So the first thing Paul is reminding these Thessalonians is that yes, we are still alive here and we remain while our loved ones have gone on into eternity. And that saddens us. But in the moment of this rift, Paul says, but there's a reunion coming in the future. And this reunion expects a return. That's the second truth that Paul is sharing with them. Verse 16, For the Lord Himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Now, as New Testament Christians, we know this is the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul and the Thessalonians anticipated this in their life, but it didn't happen. Do you anticipate it in your life? I anticipate that Jesus will come back. I think it's more likely to happen now than ever when I look at technology and I see prophecy and I'm like, this prophecy could be fulfilled today because of the technology we have that has never been known in human history. I think Christ will return in my lifetime. I may be wrong, but I think He will. And it is this promise of return that causes me, when I have rifts in my relationships, it causes me hope. Remember, the world sorrows with no hope. I sorrow at the separation with people I love, but I sorrow with hope because there is a return that Christ is going to have someday. You see, when we feel the separation, the sting of separation, but we know there's hope of reunion, of return, it makes the sting a little less harsh. For instance... It was almost nine years ago when Becky, myself, Adam, and Nathaniel, last weekend of December 2013, we gathered with you all here in this sanctuary for our first worship service together where I became your new pastor. 
It was a glorious day. I remember songs that were sung. I remember the atmosphere of everybody here. And it was a glorious day for us. But you know what? I had a mother and a father and a daughter back in Kentucky. It was not such a glorious day for them. Because they knew that that was the first worship service in a long, long time and the first of many more that Becky and I and the boys would not be worshiping our Lord together with them. You know, when one group celebrates relationally, another group is saddened. That's the rift of relationships in this world. But my parents and my daughter were not so saddened that they despaired because they knew it wouldn't be long until Becky and I and the boys would come back up and we were going to visit them. And it was the hope of our going back up there, as we have done many times throughout the past almost nine years, that kept them motivated not to sink into despair, but to be excited. Rifts happen, but the, re the return, the reunion, that keeps us motivated. So that's what Paul is telling the Thessalonians. Look, yes, your loved ones have gone on to be with the Lord. But there's a day coming when Jesus will return. He's going to descend with a shout. There's going to be a voice of the archangel. There's going to be a trumpet of God. And Christ will return. And remember that as you feel the pain of separation from your loved ones. So what's going to initiate this return? That's the third truth Paul gives to them. Folks, reunion begins with resurrection. And we're talking about the ultimate reunion Paul's referencing in verse 16, the last part in verse 17. Paul says, And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He's talking about one particular day in the future. One particular great reunion day of the Lord and all of His saints. Now we know from Scripture that when we have someone who dies in Christ, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That loved one who dies faith in Christ goes on and in that moment enters into the presence of Jesus. Now they enter into the presence in a spiritual condition. They, they enter, they, their body goes into the grave. But their spirit goes and is with the Lord. And that is one person at a time on a particular day. One person at a time on a particular day. One person at a time on a particular day. But Paul says there's coming a day in the future, and it's a day unlike any day that human history has ever known. There's coming a day in the future when Christ returns, and every one of those saints who one particular saint on a particular day has gone to be with the Lord, they in their spiritual condition will return with Jesus, who is the only one who has been permanently resurrected and glorified. But those who have died, they will return in spirit on this particular day. And as 16 says, they will receive their new, resurrected, glorified bodies together. And forever and ever, they will be with Jesus in that resurrected condition. And Paul said, that's a day unlike any day we've ever seen up to this point. And then secondly, in verse 17, he says, and it's not just for the spirits of the saints who've gone on before, but also that last generation left here on earth, they too, they're not going to be resurrected in the same way. They're going to be resurrected, resurrected glorified body, but they're going to be rapture resurrected. And they're going to receive that glorified body at the just moments, in the blink of an eye, after the saints who return in that spirit form. And all together, all believers from the moment that history began to that moment of resurrection and rapture, they all will come together with the Lord in that glorified condition. And he's like, there's nothing in history that has ever been or ever will be like that day. And he's telling the Thessalonians, you remember this. Because Jesus' return will begin with resurrection and then it leads to the fourth truth. And that is that reunion culminates with restoration. In verse 17, he says, And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, I like that word always. Always be with the Lord. You know, we're not with the Lord in that way right now. 
The Apostle Paul in another letter says, it's as though we see through a glass darkly. You might say it's, so, it's as though we see a bathroom mirror steamed over. You can just see the shape of a silhouette. We can see aspects of God, but we can't see Him face to face. He's saying, once this day happens, then we will forever and always be with the Lord face to face. Glorified condition and all. And that is the moment of restoration. And Paul's telling the Thessalonians, I know your heart is breaking because of your loved ones who have died. The only way you're going to focus rightly and keep serving and worshiping the Lord is if you keep your eyes on what Jesus is going to do in the future that makes the present bearable and we move forward. And I know every one of us in this room have experienced some of those lesser separations. And many of us have experienced that greatest separation of death. Some of you have had friends and family move away. Some of you have had children move out of your house. Some of you have had arguments with people you love dearly and it has never been the same. Some of you have family members who can't even remember who you are. All of us are going to experience the sadness of separation. But it is the hope of that great reunion day in the future that moves us toward the future. I told you a few minutes ago, Christians, we're an odd lot. The Jews only looked to the past and they found their purpose in their past. Progressives today in America only look to the future and future of this physical world only. But as Christians, we look to the past and Christ, put our faith in Him, knowing He has a grand future that is beyond all of our imaginations, which keeps us motivated in the present to worship and work until He comes back. That's what Paul was trying to share with the Thessalonians of his day, and that is what we need to remember today. There is a great reunion day coming for those who are separated in Christ. And let us never forget it. Because on that reunion day, all sadness is gone. And we praise Him forever. This morning, if you're a Christian and you're thinking about a loved one that you've lost, a mother, a father, a spouse, a child, and you know that that person has been lost to death, but that person really isn't lost. They are in Christ. I want you to be praying, praise your God, that I know your hope. And this morning, if you, if you are like, death scares me. I'm terrified of death. Let me tell you, confidence will only come in Christ. And he's already suffered the death that you deserve. And then he overpowered it so that you no longer have to worry about it. It doesn't mean you may not temporarily experience physical death, but it does mean you will not eternally know that death. And if you're scared of death, but you don't want to be any longer, Jesus stands ready to save you and be your eternal confidence. And if you're ready for that, you pray. If you will, bow your heads with me. You pray, Jesus, I know this is a sin-fallen world, and for that reason, we experience a lot of things that was not your original intent, like death. But I know, Jesus, you loved me so much, you died for me. And you rose again, and you ascended, and you're coming back. I believe this, Jesus. And I ask that you will save me, and you will forgive me forever. And I will seek to live my life for your glory and your pleasure until I come to you face to face. And it's not that you pray something you know, specific like I just said, but it's that you understand the truth and you're asking Jesus, you're my only hope, please save me. 
So, Father, this morning, as we look to the words that Paul shared with the Thessalonians, and we look to your Son who one day will return, our hope is in Him and Him alone. I pray that you will encourage us as believers, you will convict us if we're not believers, and that we will all come to that place of unity in Christ today before we leave this, this room, and that we will be prepared for that great reunion day in the future for your honor, your glory, your pleasure. That is a great reunion day that we anticipate, is it not? You know, in life, there's a lot of sad moments, and there's a lot of happy moments, and sometimes happy moments create sadness and things like that, but our hope in Christ is when we all get together, and we not only, would that be a great day when we see Jesus face to face, but we get to see the saints of all ages face-to-face for the first time in our lives. And that keeps us motivated. You know, many of you know, I'd say not many of you don't know now, but uh, I want to share a letter that I've written so that I get it all out. I I want to begin by saying that I believe I am one of the most blessed men I know. I have been blessed by God to have wonderful parents, the most beautiful and incredible wife, three great children, along with a great son-in-law and daughter-in-law, and maybe best of all, three grandsons, one granddaughter on the way, and two grandbabies in heaven that I'll see one day. But in addition to my immediate family, I have been super blessed to pastor two incredible churches, Pleasant Hill Baptist Church in Somerset, Kentucky, and now First Baptist Church in Rockwood, Tennessee. God has blessed me far beyond anything that I deserve. And I just want to take this moment to praise and to thank the Lord for all of His blessings in my life. That being said, during my life, God has called on me at different times to make major changes that would have lifelong ramifications for my family and me. When I was a teenager, I knew God was calling me into some kind of vocational ministry, which caused me to leave Somerset and go to college. But eventually, I came back to Somerset, and I married Becky. When I was about 30 years old, Becky and I knew God was calling us to leave Somerset and go to seminary. But again, I eventually came back to Somerset for my first pastorate. When I was about 43 years old, God called Becky and me to leave Somerset and move to Rockwood, Tennessee, to this church for my second pastorate. And now, once again, at age 52, as God has so often done in the past, Becky and I know God has called us to pack up our belongings and to move to Columbia, Tennessee, where I will become the new pastor at First Baptist Church of Columbia. Each move that I have made has been a time when God has grown my faith in ways I never imagined. Each move opened new doors of opportunity that very few men are ever afforded. When God moved my family to Rockwood nearly nine years ago, we knew no one. But this church welcomed us. Welcomed us with open arms in ways we could not have imagined. During these almost nine years of ministry together, I believe you have helped me become a better person and pastor. This congregation has joined us in new ministry endeavors that have stretched my faith and hopefully your faith as well. We have ministered together through mission trips, both nationally and internationally. We have ministered together throughout Rockwood and Roan County. We have seen babies born. We have seen members die. We have witnessed couples married. We have seen people saved. We have seen and experienced so many wonderful things together, and because of each of these experiences Becky and I have shared with you, our lives have been changed for the better. Over the past few months, Becky and I have struggled questioning whether God was calling us once again to leave a church we love so much, as well as leaving our son, his new wife, and their soon-arriving baby girl. We've struggled thinking about moving further away from our son who now lives and works in Cleveland, Tennessee, and even moving further away from our daughter and her family as well as both of our parents. Yet, as I have so often read in the Bible and the annals of church history, I know God has often moved His people much further away than just a few hours. 
I personally know missionaries who have been called by God to move to the other side of the globe in order to accomplish God's will for their lives. Yet when speaking to many other ministers and wives, I have heard one common refrain. When God calls, and you know it, you will never be able to rest until you obey His perfect will. We know God has called us to Columbia, Tennessee for this stage of our lives. We have cried many tears because of all of the relationships we knew that we would be leaving, but we also depart with great anticipation of what God will do through us in this next chapter of ministry. It was my intention to be able to speak with many of you privately before sharing publicly the next move God has led us to make, but in the age of the internet and social media, that intention was not able to happen. I know some of you have expressed hurt feelings over the way that you heard about our departure. Just know this. I have been as disappointed in the way the news spread as many of you have been. I am sorry for any disappointment our news has caused. It was never our intention for it to spread as it did, but sometimes things happen which is simply out of our control. Under these circumstances, and with two, only two weeks for Becky and me to move, the deacons and I have agreed that it may be best for my public resignation, resignation today to be effective immediately. This means that this will be my last worship service as pastor at First Baptist Rockwood. We will be around for a few days as we pack and move, and certainly we will be back in town on a regular basis seeing our future granddaughter. So I am sure many of our paths will cross quite frequently. However, when it comes to being called your pastor, today will be the last day. Today will be the last day that I am privileged to hold that title. Becky and I will be praying for this church for the rest of our lives, and I ask that you be praying for us as we embark on this new work of ministry. Words cannot adequately explain the joy that it has been to get to know you, love you, and have the privilege of serving alongside of each and every one of you for the glory of God. Just hear me when I say, Becky and I will be forever, we will forever love each and every one of you. May God bless you all and amen.